Section 3.6, the periodic table. The periodic table is credited to two uh, chemists slash physicists, Dmitry Mendeleev and Lothar Meyer. So they discovered or they proposed the idea for the periodic table independently within one year of each other, 1869 from Dmitry Mendeleev and 1870 in Lothar Meyer. So primarily what they looked at and what they noticed is that you could group elements based upon their chemical properties. So this kind of spawned the idea of the periodic table. So here is the modern periodic table. So we're all the way up to 118 now. These elements down here are all essentially, they've all been created by humans and they all are very unstable. They decay radioactively very quickly. In fact, everything past 92 is technically uh, man-made, interestingly. Now the lay layout of the periodic table is as such, so you've probably heard me use these words a few times throughout this chapter. Now elements are arranged from left to right and top to bottom by increasing atomic number, number of protons. Now when I use the word group, I'm referring to a column, so groups are columns. And if I use the word period, I'm referring to a row. So groups are the columns and periods are the rows. Now the IUPAC numbering system is 1 through 18, so the group or column numbers are based on 1 through 18, so 1, 2, all the way to 18. The trans transition metals are 3 through 12. Now sometimes the main group elements, so that would be columns 1, 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, sometimes these are numbered with A's. So sometimes this is called 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. So these are the main group elements. Then we have the transition metals are here in the middle. And then that little offset, that two row offset you see in the bottom, these are called, this is called the lanthanide, lanthanide actinide series. These are the F block elements. Now the only names, group names that you should definitely know are 1, 2, 17, and 18. So group one, alkali metals, group two, alkaline earth metals. 17 or 7a these are the halogens and 18 or 8a these are the noble gases these names are very common and are used a lot in chemistry now 15 or 5a these are called the nitrogens and 16 or 6a these are called the calcogens these names are much rarer you're probably not going to see them at all in this course but 1 2 17 and 18 will most certainly be referenced with these names all right and that's what i mentioned there so let's move on to the next slide here. Valence electrons in each group. So for the A's, for the main group elements, the group number equals the number of valence electrons. So group 1A elements have one valence electron. Group 2A elements have two valence electrons, so on and so forth. So it's really easy for those main group elements, their group number or their column number is equal to the number of valence electrons that they have. So quick knowledge check question. How many valence electrons does phosphorus have? So find phosphorus P in the periodic table and answer this question. How many valence electrons does it have? Okay, the correct answer here is B5. So phosphorus is in group 15 or 5A, which means it has five valence electrons. All right, so I'm gonna just keep on going and I'm gonna combine these two sections into one since that section 3.6 there was so short. So here we're going to move into section 3.7, molecular and ionic compounds. So we're going to briefly introduce molecular and ionic compounds before we dive a little deeper into them in chapter 4. So first I just want to review cations and anions. Remember cations, these are the ions that have a net positive charge. They become positively charged by losing electrons. And anions have a net negative charge atoms become negatively charged by gaining electrons and neutral atoms have the same number of protons as electrons. Okay, so going a little more detail into cations. Now typically metals, metals they tend to lose electrons and become cations. This is so they can have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So for example, if you look at potassium in the periodic table, it is number 19 in the periodic table. It is in the fourth row in the first column. So find potassium there in the periodic table. So all of these main group elements, they are always trying to have the same number of valence electrons as a noble gas because noble gases are very stable. 
So potassium faces two choices. It can attempt to gain seven electrons, right, to move forward and to have the same electron configuration as argon, or excuse me, as uh, krypton, or it could lose one valence electron to have 18 electrons to have the same configuration as argon. So it is much easier for potassium to lose one valence electron than it is for it to attempt to gain uh, seven or even up to 17 electrons to move forwards and have the same configuration as krypton. So potassium is going to lose one valence electron. It will go from having 19 electrons to having 18 electrons. So it will thus have the same electron configuration and the same number of electrons as argon. So now K plus potassium, the plus potassium cation here is very happy and stable with this noble gas-like configuration. So to find the groups, or excuse me, to find the charge of metal ions, you can base this based upon the group that they are in. So for 1A, 2A, and 3A, the charge these elements form when they form cations is simply their group number. Because remember, the group number is also the number of valence electrons. So for metals, that is the same number of electrons lost when forming a cation. So potassium is in group 1A. So when potassium forms a cation, it loses its one valence electron and it becomes a plus one cation. Calcium, Ca, is in group 2A. It has two valence electrons. So for it to have the same number of valence electrons as a noble gas, it will lose two electrons and become plus two overall. For things like aluminum, uh, or gallium or indium, they are in group 3A, they have three valence electrons, so they will lose three electrons and become plus three overall. The one exception I want to highlight there is boron, which is technically not a metal, it is a metalloid. So it generally does not form a cation in the same way that something like aluminum would, even though it's in the same column. Now to anions. Nonmetals, they tend to gain electrons to become anions. So nonmetals are in the top right of the periodic table. So they are much closer to the noble gases. So it is easier for them to gain electrons because again, just like the metals, their goal here is to have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So sulfur, sulfur is number 16 in the periodic table. It's in the third row or third period. So it only needs to gain two electrons to have the same as argon. So it will form a minus two anion. It will gain two electrons to have the same number of electrons as argon. Okay, so to find the groups and charges of nonmetal ions, this depends on by however many spots you have to go over to the right on the periodic table to get to a noble gas. So this works best for 5A, 6A, and 7A. Four is kind of right in between. It can go either way. So one, two, and three, these tend to be metals that form cations and lose electrons. Whereas groups five, six, and seven, these tend to be non-metals that will gain electrons. So for example, nitrogen is in group 5A. You have to go over three spots to get to neon, so the charge on the nitrogen anion would be N3 minus. So those nonmetals in group five here will typically gain three electrons to have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. Those in 6A gain two electrons. Those in 7A gain one electron. So just to recap, cations, specifically groups one, two, and three, their charge is a, their group number, whereas the anions, specifically 5A, 6A, and 7A, their charge is their group number minus eight. So if bromine were to form an ion, what would you expect its charge to be? Okay, correct answer here is C, negative one. Bromine is in group 7A, so it is going to form a minus one anion. It's gonna gain one electron. All right, briefly here, I wanna mention polyatomic ions. Now, polyatomic ions, they are polyatomic, or specifically these oxyanions here, they are polyatomic anions that contain one or more oxygen atom and one atom, uh, the central atom of another element. So we're not gonna to get too much into these right now in chapter three. We'll look at them more in chapter four, but essentially these polyatomic ions, they behave the same way 
as those anions we saw on the previous slide. So for example, the N3 minus ion, the nitrate, the nitrite ions, they behave the same way as something like uh, the nitrogen minus three ion would. Now the other thing I wanna highlight here with these oxyanions is the, are these helpful naming rules. So again, I would recommend coming back to this slide a little later when we get into the polyatomic ions in chapter four, but there is a method to the madness here with the namings. It's as you add or subtract oxygen uh, uh, atoms from the anions, you change the naming rules here. So you go from eight per eight to eight to eight to hypoite. So for example here, chlorite is ClO2 minus. When you add an oxygen, you change the ite to an eight and it becomes chlorate. When you add another oxygen, you add the prefix per. Or if you remove an oxygen, you add the prefix hypo here. So all of these oxyanions, oxyanions follow the same naming rules here. Okay, last two things I wanna talk about. First, I wanna introduce the idea of ionic compounds. So simply enough, these are compounds that contain ions. These ions are held together in ionic bonds. So the atoms do not share the electrons. It's the positive and the negative charge, charges of the ions that attract them to one another and form a compound. So ionic compounds almost always contain a metal and a non-metal, and they are neutral overall. So for example, table salt, sodium chloride. This is an ionic compound formed by a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Finally, molecular compounds, or more commonly, I'm going to refer to them as covalent compounds. These are typically formed from a combination of non-metals. So here, the atoms share electrons rather than transfer electrons. So for example, water, H2O, or methane, which is the primary component of natural gas, CH4. These are composed of non-metals, so these are molecular or covalent compounds. Okay, that is the end of chapter three. I'll see you in the next video when we dive into chapter four and go a little more in detail on ionic and covalent compounds.